So you are live on YouTube. Yes, sir. So should we start? Are you ready? We are ready. Good evening everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And this is Pursue 13 Edge, which is the pathology of head and neck. And we are streaming live from Regional Cancer Center, Tiruvananthapuram via Kolkata. Very special topic today, HPV associated oropharyngeal carcinoma, the talk of the town. And to talk on that, we have somebody very accomplished, Dr. Anila K.R. She's an MBBS DCP DNB pathology from G GMC Thiruvananthapuram, Kerala. Presently, she is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology at the Regional Cancer Center, Thiruvananthapuram. And she has done a DNB from GMC Thiruvananthapuram, joined the department in RCC in 2007. And presently, she is there for the last 14 years. And right now, she is an associate professor with special interest in surgical pathology, especially head and neck, endocrine, and also in cytopathology. She's got multiple publications in national and international peer-reviewed journals, awarded the fellowship by the Union for International Cancer Control, UICC, in 2018. She had also undergone training in head and neck cancer pathology from the famous Mayo Clinic, USA. Before I ask Madam to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request to Dr. Anila Ma'am, please share your screen and let us start. Yeah, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Nadeem and Nilam Pathology for this invitation and uh, also for the kind introduction. So let me start sharing my screen. So is it visible now? No, not yet. Just uh, press present now your entire screen. Press in the center of the thing and then press share. Yeah, just one second. Yes, now your screen is there. We can see your screen. Great. Just choose your PowerPoint. Yeah, remove the other pop-up as, as well. Let us first. Yeah, great. Start, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, today's topic is a relevant topic of today, like HPV-associated oropharyngeal carcinoma. So, going on to the topic, if we see head and neck pathology as such, over the past two decades, there has been a tremendous development in this area of pathology. And to, if we seriously consider the breakthrough in this area of head and neck pathology, it has been mainly in three areas. First is the oropharyngeal cancer, which we will be dealing in detail today because of our knowledge about HPV-associated oropharyngeal cancer, which is essentially a squamous cell carcinoma only, but 
a totally different entity when compared to your routine oral cavity squamous and carcinomas. Secondly is your salivary gland neoplasms. In that area also there has been immense advancement because of our knowledge of molecular pathology of salivary gland neoplasms which help us in diagnosis and also in targeted therapy. Third area is in sinonasal tract tumors. So it is amazing that such a small anatomical area can give rise to such a diverse variety of tumors like your nut carcinoma, the smart B1 deficient carcinoma and uh, the biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma and so on. So to understand today's topic, we need to understand what has been the traditional approach to oral cancers or oral squamous cell carcinomas. So we were for years using this blanket terminology of oral cancer for all the squamous cell carcinomas of the different subsites of the oral cavity. So for a change to happen to this age-old concept, you have to self-consciously try to Think about bring about changes to your understanding of the disease, your reporting pattern and so on. So because for years it has been deeply ingrained into our thought process that the oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas, whatever the subsides, it is essentially a single entity. Okay. But now we know that this HPV associated oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas are a totally different entity though they are squamous cell carcinomas only and considering that the WHO in the fourth edition of head and neck tumors have given a separate chapter dedicated to this oropharynx. So let us briefly all of us are aware with the different subsites of the oral cavity. So you have the lip, the upper and lower lips, the upper and lower alveolar ridges, the hard palate, the soft palate, the retromolar trigon, the floor of mouth, the tonsils, the uvula, the buccal mucosa, and of course our tongue. And of the tongue, the anterior two-third tongue is the mobile tongue or the oral tongue. So before we go on to this topic, we have to know what is this oropharynx. So oropharynx will be your base of tongue, this base immobile, base posterior one-third of the tongue, which has your palatine tonsils. Then the which, uh, excuse me, which has your lingual tonsil. Then you have the palatine tonsils, uvula and soft palate along with the posterior and lateral pharyngeal wall. These together constitute this subside of oropharynx. Okay, so when we are talking about the HPV associated oropharyngeal cancers, our interest, area of interest is basically these two. The base of tongue and the palatine tonsils because of the presence of tonsillar tissue in both these areas here the lingual tonsils and here you have the palatine tonsils so what is the uh, importance of this tonsillar tissue being present there what makes it different from the rest of your oral cavity so as I said now oropharynx is a separate subside which is distinct from the rest of the oral cavity because of the presence of tonsillar tissue and the tonsillar tissue it's different from the rest of the oral cavity because it has that tonsillar crypt epithelium or the reticulated epithelium which is so intimately associated with the lymphoid based mucosa so that we call it the lymphoepithelium and viral associated carcinomas are known to have this tropism for lymphoid based mucosa whether it is your EBV associated mesopharyngeal carcinoma or this HPV associated oropharyngeal cancers. So today we will discuss a bit detail about the tonsillar crypt anatomy. Now crypt, the word meaning itself is hidden. So you have a very fragile epithelium which is hidden or crypt 
it is a cryptic epithelium within that dense lymphoid stroma. So what is the difference between a tonsillar crypt epithelium and the surface tonsillar epithelium? So the reticulated epithelium of the tonsillar crypt is thinner. It is fenestrated, second point, that is the basement membrane where Elsewhere, when you have a stratified squamous epithelium lining the rest of your oral cavity, including the base of the tongue or your tonsillar surface, the uh, crypt epithelium has a discontinuous basement membrane. So, inherently, there are holes or defects in the basement membrane. Third important point, it has intraepithelial capillaries. So, if you see all these points, so compared to a thick stratified squamous epithelium, you are having a thin reticulated epithelium. The basement membrane is inherently discontinuous or the basal cell layer is discontinuous and you have intraepithelial capillary. So, vascular supply is there. So, there is a natural barrier for tumor cell spread is absent in this crypt epithelium. So, for comparing, this is the crypt epithelium compared to the normal squamous epithelium that you find elsewhere in the oral cavity. So, see it is thinner. You have this discontinuous basal cell layer through which the lymphoid cells, monocytes, all your immune cells can traffic into the epithelium. Whereas here, you see a very rigid basal cell layer. With, and then the spinosum, granulosum and the stratum corneum. So for a tumor to invade into the stroma in the rest of the oral cavity, it has to breach this basal layer, invade into the stroma and produce desmoplastic stromal reaction to become invasive. Whereas here, this is inherently having Holes. So, for a tumor in the arising in the crypt epithelium, there is no uh, point in invading into the stroma and all. It is inherently having these gaps, okay, making it easier for tumor spread. Then, adjacent to this thin epithelium, you are having abundant lymphoid follicles, and this enables lymphocyte trafficking into the epithelium. You get a lot of intraepithelial lymphocytes and mononuclear cells. So what is the importance? These lymphoid-rich tissue are exposed to antigens present in the oropharynx, including your HPV antigen. So this is and another thing that you have to remember about this reticulated epithelium is that they are basal appearing squamous embedded in the rich lymphoid lymphoid stroma. So, this you don't have a gradation like basal, so the spinosum, granulosum there. All the cells are basal appearing squamous cells. This is a schematic representation. You will get a better idea. This is the surface of the tonsil and here when you reach the crypt, you can see that there are gaps or holes at the basal cell layer through which the lymphocytes, monocytes and other immune cells can traffic within the epithelium. The HPV virus, the, that antigen can react with these lymphocytes. So, the, when you speak about high-risk HPV associated or pharyngeal carcinoma, from any point of view, whether it is epidemiology, clinical, pathophysiology, morphology, molecular, any aspect you take, it is different from conventional epidemic spinal cell carcinoma. That concept has to, you have to understand it and apply it to understand this entity and why this is so much different and why there is so much hype about this virus HPV associated or pharyngeal carcinoma uh, in spite of the fact that it is a spinal cell carcinoma. So, if we uh, look into the demographics, this type of cancers are seen in younger age group. So traditionally, you, when you think of squamous cell carcinoma, oral cavity, buccal mucosa, alveolus, you have an older patient, 60s, in the 60s or 70s. Here you get a patient a decade or so younger than the classical 
age group and risk factor that is the most important thing so conventionally you think of oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma immediately the risk factor that you ask your patient is how much uh, cigarettes you smoke do you chew pan do you use any other tobacco products so that is not the case in this it is a sexual behavior that is contributing to this disease that is the etiology in fact oral sex has been found to be the risk factor for this hpv associated oropharyngeal cancer so when you elicit history from a patient you have to keep this in mind from the clinical side also this is a disease more commonly seen in developed countries because of these behavioral aspects this disease is still is seen more in developed countries but we also are beginning to see cases of this hpv associated cancer and what about smoking does it have any role of course it has a role in that it is a co carcinogen so the primary thing is that this disease is associated with sexual behavior but if that patient is also a smoker then that facilitates the progress of an hpv infection of the oropharynx into a cancer now clinically what do you expect so generally speaking if you have a tongue a mobile tongue squamous cell carcinoma the patient presently presents uh, with a large primary then only you get a lymph node mets okay so it is a, in the uh, higher stages of the disease that you see this large lymph nodes but classically the difference in this case is that usually the primary tumor is very small So I have told that the tumor is seen in the tonsillar crypt, so it is cryptic. And surface, if you examine the patient, you won't be seeing any tumor. It is difficult to detect clinically tumors of the oropharynx because they arise in the crypt epithelium. The surface looks normal, or maybe some dissymmetry in the size of the tonsils, some dysphagia. So non-specific symptoms are that with which the patient. reports to you so it is a small primary so what is a classical presentation the classical presentation is as carcinoma of unknown primary patients coming to you with large cystic lymph nodes of level 2 3 that is a classical presentation they are cystic they are large and usually seen in the upper and middle jugulodigastric lymph nodes with unknown and, and as unknown primary you have to go back when you, the patient comes with this clinical uh, presentation and you elicit the history then you go back and look and maybe you will be lucky to detect the primary in a biopsy from the tonsil but in spite of these presenting with the large cystic lymph nodes at initial presentation itself these group of tumors have a very good overall survival So it is 82 percentage versus 57 percentage as in the case of conventional squamous cell carcinoma. So that is it. And what is the difference in microscopy? So microscopy, the most common morphology is that of non-keratinizing. And you can get focal keratinization, but the classic morphology is non-keratinizing. and vessel out so if you remember what i have told about the reticulated epithelium these cells are generally vessel out cells so that it is actually recapitulating that morphology so you have this vessel out morphology that is cells with scanty cytoplasm and ovoid bar spindle shaped so uh, relatively you get a monomorphic hyperchromatic appearance so this is one of our cases a wherein this was a tonsillar biopsy showing that it is actually a monotonous you see blue cells non keratinizing hyperchromatic that is a pearx keratinization can be absent is usually absent but it can be focally present also that doesn't rule out an hpv associated cancer and there is frequent mitosis and apoptosis so you if you see the basal layers everywhere there is more of mitosis and apoptosis of the base cell layer so here also in the cancer cells so there is frequent mitosis and apoptosis homodonecrosis can be frequent and there is permeation by lymphocytes so that is a classic 
morphology of this HPV associated or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So these are different pictures from our own cases. So this is a higher purview where you can appreciate that the celloid appearance, rather monotonous, hyperchromatic, high MC ratio, lymphocytes and apoptosis, mitosis. Okay. So this is still higher power. So sometimes they are so such an appearance you may have to do a, a immunophore spam cell differentiation to confirm that this is spam cell carcinoma because they are so bestial or new characterization and with this uh, mitosis apoptosis sometimes you require immunos like uh, your p40 p63 or ck5 or 6 to confirm that they are spam cell carcinomas so, like the conventional spinal cell carcinoma, this entity also has different variants like uh, lymphoepithelial-like, the papillary adenosquamous, the sarcomethoid and small cell. So, all these variants can come in HPV-associated carcinoma. But uh, the small cell, uh, as everywhere else, is associated with a bad prognosis. And now something about P16 INC, we, are, we all are aware of this P16 INC now and uh, P16 is used as a standalone test. That is a recommendation from either, either the CAP, the ASCO, the AJCC, the UICC, every one is of the opinion that P16 immunohistochemistry can be used as a standalone test in the diagnosis of this entity. Why so? When you recommend a test for universal application, you have to take into consideration so many elements. It is not that it is the gold standard, but you have to take into consideration its availability, the uh, economic point of view. Is it cheap enough so that it can be uh, applied worldwide? Okay, Is the facility available? So considering all those points, P16 can be used as a standalone test, though it is just a surrogate marker. You are not directly demonstrating HPV with this P16 IHC. And they have put the AJCC as well as the CAP has come with strict criteria in the interpretation of this P16 IHC. There should be diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity of more than 70%. So focal positivity is a no, it is not taken as positive uh, nuclear alone, cytoplasmic alone, no. So it has to be diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity of more than 70 percentage. In fact, the AJCC has a still higher criteria of 75 percentage. So 70, 75, that is it. And usually when you do a P16, you get a diffuse nice positivity of nuclear and cytoplasmic strain. Then what are the molecular tests for HPV that is available? You have the in situ hybridization of um, DNA and RNA in situ hybridization is available. The PCR test is available. The NGS is also there wherein you can subtype the, the type of HPV. Subtype of HPV is possible with the next generation sequencing. So, to briefly, uh, this is a very uh, simple and easy to understand uh, representation of how the HPV infects the cell and how we use P16 IHC for its diagnosis. This is uh, from uh, the American Journal of Surgical Pathology by Bishop et al. So here the, the HPV enters the host cell, the double-stranded DNA is getting integrated into the host DNA. So the viral integration happens here. The next step is transcription, wherein the mRNA E6 and E7 mRNA are formed. Next is translation, where the E6 protein and E7 protein are formed. And E6 binds with the P53. So, the P53 is inactivated here. So, there is tumor suppressor inactivation happening here. And what does E7 do? E7 binds with the retinoblastoma protein. So, when it binds with retinoblastoma protein, there is uh, apparent overexpression of P16 because the retinoblastoma protein that is getting blocked. 
and you get basic strain over expression which is what we detect by our immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So at these different levels you can detect the HPV like here you can detect the DNA in situ hybridization, this mRNA you can find the RNA in situ hybridization of course. This is more sensitive than the other uh, tests for detecting HPV. So next this is the INC pictures. From this you can understand. See the surface epithelium, this real staining that you see is not a positivity. It is in the crypt epithelium that this customer man rises and see the nice diffuse uh, cytoplasmic nuclear and cytoplasmic staining. The higher point view. This is from our case. So P16 nuclear and cytoplasmic diffuse to more than 70 percentage. Now, since I have um, mentioned how this P16 IHC helps in the diagnosis, let me once again tell that P16 is sensitive. The sensitivity is 94 percentage, and more than 90 percentage in most of the studies. But it is not specific. It, it can be, uh, the P16 over expression can be due to many other factors other than this HPV. So this interpretation of P16 has to be very careful and done under, when there is an appropriate background. You have to correlate with the clinical, what you see under the microscope and then decide on your P16 and then interpret it. And we have, several studies have shown that about 8 to 33 percentage of P16 positive cases uh, can show negative research with molecular, HPV molecular when you do. This can be due to technical issues and also due to the fact that the positivity, P16 positivity which you demonstrated would have been independent of HPV gene expression. It could have been due to some other causes. So, uh, a guideline towards when you uh, have to supplement your P16 IHC with a molecular testing. So, as I said, classically you ex expect this HPV uh, carcinomas to be non keratinizing or predominantly non keratinizing So, in that case, if you get a P16, a strong, like 2 to 3 intensity score and uh, more than 70 75 percentage diffuse cytoplasmic and nuclear strain then there is no requirement to confirm it with molecular. Similarly, if it is a keratinizing, you don't expect uh, uh, that HPV squamous cell customers to be that keratinizing. So when it is keratinizing and the P16, you somehow did a P16 and it is negative, then also there is no need to do a HPV molecular testing further. But then when there is discordance, like you are expecting in a non-keratinizing to be HPV positive but your P16 is negative, then it is useful to supplement it with a molecular testing of HPV. Similarly, a keratinizing squamous cell, you are not expecting a P16 positive but somehow your IHC gave you a nice strong P16 positivity, then also it is better to do a HPV molecular testing. So this is HPV in situ hybridization. All these black dots show the positivity. Now, several studies have compared the, the have studied the prognosis with these HPV molecular and P16 pattern. So they say that when you have a P16 positive along with a molecular positivity for HPV, that group of patients have the best prognosis. If it is P16 positive but the molecular HPV uh, testing is negative, those group of patients have intermediate prognosis and the worst scenario is when the patient has HPV molecular test positive with P16 negative or both negative. So those patients are having worse prognosis. And of course, uh, more than 90 percentage of the oropharyngeal uh, squamous cell carcinoma which are HPV related is caused by high risk HPV type 16 and HPV 33 and 35 about 2 to 3 percentage and HPV 18 is even less less than 1 percentage. So another point that the patho as we pathologists should be aware of is that the grading 
when whatever tumor we come across, there is a general tendency that we are taught to grade those tumors so that that will relate to finally to the outcome or prognosis of the patient. So, but in this entity, grading is not recommended. So, the WHO doesn't or the uh, CAP or EGCC, they don't recommend grading of this HPV positive or pharyngeal sperm cell carcinoma. Why so? Because if we have seen that this tumor has a non-keratinizing acelloid morphology and uh, you have mitosis, apoptosis, uh, you have seen the previous picture. So, uh, if we apply the classical uh, uh, ways to grade a uh, uh, great sperm cell carcinoma into this entity, most of the cases will be wrongly diagnosed as high grade. Or poorly differentiated. In, have, in fact, I have residents writing of slides as poorly differentiated spermis. But whenever you think of the subsite oropharynx and you are coming across a non keratinizing spermis cell carcinoma, please don't grade it. Because as we have seen, these tumors are actually very well differentiated tumors. They are just recapitulating the reticulated epithelium, which is bacilloid, which is having mitosis, which is having apoptosis. So that is the inherent uh, nature of the reticulated epithelium that these well differentiated tumors are recapitulating. And it is not because they are actually high grade tumors. So don't grade a HPV positive or a pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So this is from the net that this beautiful picture I have got. So you can nicely see this is the reticulated epithelium and see this area is the, uh, the cancer, the non keratinizing cancer and see how closely it mimics the uh, parent epithelium, the reticulated crypt epithelium. And another point that I would like to highlight is that in wherever we um, Describe carcinomas, we tend to call it in situ, invasive, and all. So, here there is no in situ carcinoma. So, because why? But traditionally, when you, uh, when I showed that picture of the spatified squamous epithelium, the squamous cell carcinoma has to breach the basement membrane, invade the stroma, and produce a desmoplastic stromal reaction. Then we identify that in patient. So, it's limited to the epithelium. We call it uh, in situ squamous cell carcinoma, but here there is no in situ squamous cell carcinoma. So, HPV, the oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, there is no uh, in situ carcinoma because the basement membrane is discontinuous. So, there is no point of the tumor having to breach the basement membrane.
and category and the pathological and category if you see is solely based on the number of lymph nodes not on the size not on extra nodal extension so just on the number of lymph nodes so p n0 is no regional lymph node and one is one to four lymph nodes chain nets and two is in more than four lymph nodes and you interestingly you don't have a pn3 because that is because when in evidence based studies it was shown that the n3 n3 can was showing a better prognosis than n2 so to avoid the ambiguity they have hcc has taken out this pn3 from this uh hp16 positive uh, hpv associated or pharyngeal uh, carcinomas and also clinically also it is different you have a 6 cm node still being classified as n1 okay and uh, n2 is uh, still 6 with contralateral or bilateral and when it is larger than 6 it becomes n3 so that is the difference in the n staging of this group of tumors and mind you there is no need to comment on extra nodal extension in fact we pathologists will rarely only come across such a scenario because these tumors are so radio sensitive most instances they will be the patients will be given radiotherapy or chemotherapy so it is highly unlikely that you will get a nodal dissection to report on in the case of p16 uh, positive or a pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma so a talk on this uh, topic will not be complete without mention about carcinoma of unknown primary or tuft because i have already mentioned this is the uh, Uh, symptom or this is the classical clinical presentation with which the patients present so the drug the, so because of this because of our knowledge of hpv associated or pharyngeal cancer there has been dramatic change in the approach of in the diagnosis of cervical nodal metastases of unknown primary because hpv positive or pharyngeal cancer are known to present as large bulky metastatic cervical nodes with occult primary in the oropharynx and you are supposed to do p16 hc or molecular test for hpv in those cervical nodes sometimes after you do this then the clinician goes back and if they are lucky in a biopsy they will pick up this primary tumors so this is the as i said this is a level uh, the level 2 and level 3 the upper and middle and the gyloidogastric nodes which are the common sites of presentation of this uh, nodal metastasis and it is a recommendation from cap that hpv is preserved in the metastatic sites and so demonstration of hpv in the cytologies from cervical lymph nodes strongly raises the possibility for an oropharyngeal primary tumor but i would like to add a word of caution so suppose you get a, a patient uh, has carcinoma of unknown primary you find that it is a non characterized squamous cell carcinoma mets and positive for p16 okay well and good but that immuno reactivity for p16 should be interpreted with caution that is because 20 percentage of metastatic skin so suppose you have a skin tumor in the head and neck region skin squamous cell carcinoma or you we very well know that lung squamous cell carcinoma can also present with cervical lymph node mets these are these have absolutely no association with high risk uh, hpv but they are known and it has been proven that they can show 70 percentage of nuclear and cytoplasmic positive staining with p16 so p16 positivity alone does not equate with hpv positive or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma so that you have to take that uh, message home it is you you have to get the appropriate background you have to ha uh, thoroughly examine the patient from the clinical side and rule out the primary in, and you have to rule out a primary elsewhere before considering that this could be p16 positivity due to this hpv associated oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma and it is well and good if you get a 
biopsy later on from the tonsil and you are able to prove that primary HPV associative or pharyngeal cancer. And also one of the closest mimic of a cystic metastatic squamous cell carcinoma medicine in the cervical region is a brangial plexus. So it, uh, some studies have shown that even brangial plexus, the P16 can take up in those cases also. So it's highly non-specific. Though being a sensitive test, it is non-specific and it has to be judiciously used and interpreted. Now, what are the challenges? Now that we have known this entity, what are the challenges associated with this HPV-associated autopharyngeal spinal cell carcinoma? So, the clinical significance is widespread, right from prevention to the prognostication. So, prevention now, instead of the smoking and the traditional risk factors, you have to educate your patients regarding that this carcinoma is arising because of your sexual behavior. You have to educate to prevent this disease. Then diagnosis is also difficult because the, the primaries are usually small and you have to search for them. You have to have that differential in your mind when you see your patients. The treatment wise also, it is because even with the lymph node meds, these patients are going to behave uh, or having a better outcome. So maybe treatment side also, you should have second thoughts and prognostication, as I said, the prognostication is extremely good for this type of, uh, the prognosis is extremely good for this type. Now for us pathologists, what is our challenge? So first of all, you have to recognize, so even though in our Indian scenario, the conventional squamous cell carcinomas are the most common, we are beginning to see cases of HPV associated cancers. So you have to keep an open mind when you come across such cases, especially base of tongue and tonsillar biopsies. If you are seeing this non keratinizing and you go back, you talk with your clinician and they say that the patient has cystic nodes at the 11, 2 and 3, please do a P16 and you discuss with your clinician and the designation, how to designate the report. The reporting of HPV positive, you have to um, be careful in wording your reports. So, in the oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, word it whether is it keratinizing or non keratinizing, and never use the term in situ, even if you feel like it is as limited to the tonsillar crypt, because as I mentioned earlier, the tumor would have already metastasized by the time you report on this. So, the P16 positive do not grade. That also we have discussed previously. Why you are? Because it will lead, if you apply the conventional uh, parameters, you may invariably uh, wrongly grade it as a poorly differentiated of a high grade carcinoma. And you have to use judicious use and interpretation of P16. Now, treatment and prognosis of this entity depends on clinical stage. The T1 disease which is confined to the tonsil, tonsillectomy is uh, well and good. But otherwise, this is a radiosensitive tumor and usually they give radiotherapy. And uh, in higher stage tumors, maybe with 